it's been a great day, and um, I think a lot of good information has uh, has come. And I just want to show of hands how many people feel like they got some good value out of today. Yes, that's what we wanted. And when we started looking at what we want to um, talk about, what we wanted to make the conference about, we said, well, what is sustainable biodiesel? What really, um, what makes biodiesel sustainable? What differentiates us from the other folks in the industry? And we sit, and we went through the different pieces. What are the pieces we want to include? And if you look at the way that we structured the day today, feedstocks, big issue everywhere you look when people look at biodiesel. Biodiesel is not sustainable because of feedstocks. Then we went on to fuel quality, which has been what we've been about since the beginning. Um, this organization has sort of been looking at that. And, um, and going through the day, just setting out best practices and um, sort of laying a framework for us all to come together as a community. And last year we spoke about, you know, where do we want to go from here? What are we? How, who are we as a community? Emily, you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. So um, last year we had, we, similar to this, we had a lot of momentum, a lot of great energy. In the wrap-up discussion, we sort of talked about let's, let's work on defining ourselves and let's figure out how to harness this energy and where to go from here. In response to concerns over the rapid growth and inconsistencies in the U.S. biodiesel industry's overall direction, Kelly teamed up with Andy Nelson, with Daryl Hanna, to create the Sustainable Biodiesel Alliance, which is an organization that seeks to create standards and criteria for sustainable practices in biodiesel feedstock procurement, in production, and in distribution. So, welcome, Kelly. I want to give a little bit of background. I know you, you've heard some of the background for Pacific Biodiesel and why, um, why this alliance has formed. And it's something that I've been thinking about for a couple of years now. I've been talking to Annie about it in the last year since I've known Daryl. We've been getting closer and closer. I've been talking to her about it. And I think we um, actually formulated the idea of this organization when we were at Annie's birthday party and Daryl had her Willie Nelson braids on. <laughs> Um, but we, we got to the point where we're looking around the industry and, you know, for a long time we had, our company had forged ahead always doing something different and kind of ignoring all the people that told us we couldn't do what we were trying to do. I mean, even our own friends 10 years ago were saying, oh, that's really cute what you're doing, but biodiesel is never going to go anywhere. It's never going to be a big thing. And as it gained more and more momentum, um, we started seeing the, um, the threats of the big companies coming in and people saying, well, you might have you might have created this great industry and you're getting somewhere, but you're not going to be able to make a make this sustainable in your business because you know these Chevron guys are going to run right over you and Exxon's going to come and take over and kind of ignored that for a couple of years until we started seeing the announcements that Chevron wants to build a hundred million gallon a year plant and you know we we heard other companies saying we're going to be the next Exxon of biodiesel. And so the last year we've been thinking we really have to do something about this to um, protect all of us who really believe in the value to communities of um, locally produced biodiesel. And uh, we, we've kind of been talking about this, as I said, for uh, about six months. And then we had a real breakthrough when uh, I got an email from the corporate headquarters of Hard Rock Cafe saying they wanted to be our corporate sponsor. So, that kind of kicked it into high gear, and at that point, we decided to file um, as a nonprofit corporation. And so we've got this, um, it's, we're called um, Sustainable Biodiesel Alliance. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting reading over the notes from last year that Emily gave me because um, I think very, uh, one of the names that came up for an organization was very close to it, called Sustainable Biofuels Alliance. It was actually um, one of Daryl's um, ideas to, to call ourselves that, we decided, well, let's start with biodiesel and maybe move into the realm of other fuels after we come up with some standards and criteria. But our, main, our focus for this organization is to create um, some kind of a green seal um, that's got uh, attached to standards and criteria for sustainability, um, sustainability in all um, parts of the uh, biodiesel industry from feedstock to feedstock delivery to production to distribution in wholesale and retail and so that when you drive up to a biodiesel pump and you see this green seal on there, you know, the Sustainable Biodiesel Alliance seal, you know that you're buying fuel that has a certain level of integrity and the businesses um, are doing sustainable practices. So it's everything, it's, what we're doing is what everybody here has been working towards and 
also protecting our communities, I think, because uh, one thing that really inspired me was that the um, DVD, um, The End of Suburbia. How many people here saw that? You know, we have to get back to communities where we're taking care of each other, we're doing business with each other, we're walking to our schools and our parks, we're making our own energy. That's part of that. And so, you know, we've always adhered to this model. And I have to tell you, in the early years, me being in uh, marketing and sales, when people would call up and say, well, I really want, I want to get into biodiesel production, I want you to build me a 30 million gallon a year plant. And Bob would say, no, you are not doing that. And you know, when, you, when a salesperson hears that somebody wants what they have and wants it in a big way and you have to say no, that's like one of the worst feelings in the world, well, why not? You know, and so this was a vision that my husband Bob had in the very early years, and no, we're going to stay small, we're gonna focus on communities, we're gonna build relationships within communities. And um, so that's so, so. This whole um, thing is built around that whole concept, and and it's something that we've seen happen in Hawaii, where um, on Maui we work closely with the uh, um, yellow grease haulers. We work closely with the distribution side. Um, you know, we we actually are probably one of the first um, biodiesel companies to work with a petroleum company. And I remember back in those early years. Um, I used to get phone calls from other people in the industry saying, aren't you worried about ending up in cement shoes? Why would you even deal with a petroleum company? And I said, well, you know, these guys are friends. I've known the president of Maui Oil for 15 years. We sat on nonprofit boards together. And if something happens, I really, you know, they're, they're in there with us. They're taking care of us as much as we're, you know, allowing them to be part of this. And, and really, for about the first three months that we were doing business with them, um, the president used to come to our office about once a week and just thank us for allowing to be part of it. So that's the difference, I think, between community-based biodiesel production and the centralized model that, that Bob was talking about earlier. So anyway, the, that's, that's why we got into it. What we have done is um, we've, we're, we just um, filed our papers in December, so we're not um, completely um, in the 501c3 yet, but we're working towards that. We've got a a pretty high-level um, attorney on Maui who's vo volunteering all of his services to make this happen, and he's on our board. We've got a fairly small board right now, and in fact, we have a board meeting tomorrow. We're going to talk about how we're going to expand this to be representative of all the stakeholders. And, it doesn't, and then we have a lot of people, too. We have people who are connected with this um, summit today who are um, on our committees. You know, so we're looking for more people to do committee work um, who aren't necessarily on our board, but. Um, Jim Kleinschmidt is one of them, and he spoke here earlier, and Suzanne Hunt, and um, uh, anybody else that's here that's um, but uh, Oh, and, and, and um, the folks from the EPA are um, are helping us with some of the, the, the um, input for standards, and Kent Bullard also. So we've got some, uh, let me tell you who the, uh, the board right now is. We, our co-chairs are Daryl and Annie Nelson and I'm the vice chair, and then we've got, um, and Bob is actually on the board, but he's trying to matriculate out of this board onto our, what we're gonna have as an honorary or advisory board, because we have the folks that want to support us, but don't want to have to attend every board meeting. So we've got, just got an email from Jack Johnson yesterday, and he's on board, so he'll be one of our um, advisory supporters. Um, let's see, <laughs> who do I see out still? Yeah, let's got, talk about the committees, I think. Okay. We meet what we want um, we want support. We want all of your input. Everyone as much input as anyone's want. Right now, we only have three committees, and we need to expand that as well. We've got. We started out with what we thought was um, the most important thing to get rolling on, and we have a, a standards committee, which Bob is chairing. We have a fundraising marketing committee, which I'm chairing, and we have an outreach committee, which Daryl is chairing. And so far, all, each of those committees. <coughs> has met once, I think the outreach committee still hasn't met, so, um, but we're fairly new and um, we're just building the structure. We actually, we need a budget committee, we need a bylaws committee, we need all these kinds of committees and we need more help, like Daryl said. So, uh, one of the things I'm gonna do probably is keep very closely in touch with Emily and Emily can maybe solicit information. So I, would, I really need to get cards from everybody or contact information from everybody who wants to be involved, but, um, I don't know if my person can handle all the cards of all the people that are here today, so we'll stay in touch. Um, and um, what, what the Standards Committee is doing right now that's very important is working towards um, coming up with a set of standards and criteria. And I think the first part of that is coming up with uh, principles and, um, and kind of a, 
the principles behind these standards is what we want to do. And there's a lot of information. You know, we're not, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of information out there, and that's why we've got people like Suzanne and, and Jim and Michael Bowman is also on our board. Oh, Michael made it here today. Um, to, um, to bring in um, information from the international world that's already working on this. There's another gentleman on our board named Edward Shi who's, um, who created the Borneo Foundation that's looking at trying to... Um, uh, make an imprint for sustainable palm oil because he's very uh, he's very worried about what's happening in Indonesia with the deforestation. Um, so those are those, that's kind of the background of this this community. It started with like the three of us and it just kept growing and growing. And the people that got on on board uh, brought more contacts and we saw that there's a lot of information out there. That, um, there's an, uh, a whole international. Biofuel, sustainable biofuels movement that's trying to create criteria and so we're looking at that what can we draw from that to um, this idea of sustainable community-based biodiesel. There are some different issues which is why we didn't call ourselves sustainable biofuels because there, that has the connotation of ethanol. There's some different issues with ethanol. Um, right now you can't look at ethanol as a community-based thing because you can't make a, an ethanol plant that small so we wanted to divide out um, the that part of it, so we could focus on you know what we all we all know that we can make these small um, biodiesel plants in our communities viable, and so we want to support that. Um, but um, that's the so the technical committee is working on that. We have um, kind of some loose deadlines right now. Um, we want to get roll out those principles by the beginning of summer and do a, a press conference, and the Hard Rock Cafe wants to host that. And they also have offered to us their biggest fundraiser of the year, which is their Ambassadors of Rock um, series. There's like seven concerts that they're doing. Um, it, this is just kind of a funny story. When they first emailed me, it was Willie Nelson told them to email me, and I got an email from the corporate headquarters saying, we're, we're, we're planning some fundraisers, and we really want the biodiesel charity to benefit. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to email them back and say, well, we're trying not to be a charity. <laughs> we feel like it sometimes, but we really want to be a business. So, but let me, let me, uh, you know, and I, I told them about this idea I've been thinking about, and then I told Daryl about, and then Annie and I have talked about, and I, you know, I really like to create. Maybe this is a good time to create this nonprofit. So that was the impetus for actually filing, getting the papers filed before the end of the year. You know, because I've been talking to them in the beginning of December. I found this um, attorney that was recommended to me. Um, by our Maui Economic Development Department, just as a, as, a, as a, you know, I know this guy, he wants to help you guys, and why don't you call him? And um, so we, we were able to get a, a meeting together real quickly, and poor Daryl was sick, but she called him. I mean, most of the people called him. We were going to have this at Annie and Willie's house, and it was funny how, you know, everybody that said they would be at the meeting were, was there, but most of them that were going to be there were there by phone, and even Annie wasn't there. He, Annie and Willie were gone, so I went into their house and set up this meeting, and everybody called in. <laughs> and it was great. We had so much support and so much enthusiasm. And when you hear enthusiasm from people like, you know, Suzanne Hunt and Jim Kleinschmidt saying it's great to finally have industry leading us in this way so that it's not just the researchers and the people in D.C. and the people in um, these nonprofit um, scientific organizations, it's industry saying, we need these guidelines. We want these guidelines for ourselves to lead ourselves in the right path. Um, so, so anyway, we're, we're looking at um, an event in September. We're all another another um, group that's helping us is Farm Aid. So we're trying to tie it into the Farm Aid event. Um, and so we're going to try to get some more input from this group on um, principles and standards. And if anybody wants to help with, you know, the fundraising and marketing side, we've got some, actually uh, Willie and Annie's um, youngest son is quite a great artist, and he's working on our, developing our logo right now. But if you have any ideas, you know, we're, we're happy to take that in too. And um, I'm just here to get input from this group to take back to our group, and we're, you know, we're really happy that this is coming at an opportune time for us because we have our next board meeting tomorrow. But, uh, this is absolutely what we all need. Um, my only comment would be is that as we plan the, the structure of this and, and the standards that we go ahead and try to uh, level the playing field, the industry laid playing field for these smaller scale and more sustainable businesses because currently, um, as most of us know, these small scale, scale sustainable businesses are quite often the most 
hardest to go ahead and pay those fair living wages and things of that nature. So as we go forward and develop these standards, we'd really like to see how these standards could directly relate to public policy that helps level this playing field for uh, our small small scale industries. A lot of ground when you say the word sustainable. And when you're trying to come up with standards, you're going to have a bunch of issues come up if you're trying to wrap everything that you're wrapping into the word sustainable. Um, and you're wanting um, to get broad industry buy-in to the sustainability issue, but you're also trying to come up with the smaller local producer sort of element in what you're trying to do. My suggestion is that you really need to define an activity related to sustainability of oil supply on a broader level, because that's a broader industry issue that they're going to have to grapple with because Europe is already grappling with it. And then you have the issue of recycled oil or local production, and those are really two very different issues. And it's going to be difficult to mesh them because on the one hand you want to push a sustainability initiative in relation to feedstock standards and tracking of oil and having all of the petroleum industry actually track the sustainability of the biodiesel and the oil that it was produced from. And then you have this other issue that's, that's different. That's, well, maybe you need a recycling or a green or a local or made locally or, or something that relates to the sector of the industry that this group represents that's much more about smaller volume production with very local sources and and if you had two different sort of label emphasis it would be a lot easier to fit all the issues into them because I think they're very different issues. Sustainability is a very important part of our business plan and it is exciting to see that uh, there's an association trying to put a, together standards for what sustainability is in biodiesel. While feedstocks, I think uh, most of all of us uh, can agree uh, being an agricultural product uh, can be done sustainably, but methanol, <coughs> sodium hydroxide, sodium methylate, potassium hydroxide, these things are not uh, sustainable, they're not organic, they're not agricultural projects, and they're, or, and they're not local. How do you suppose we deal with uh, the uh, rebuttal from the community if we come up with a tag that says you're sustainable? So I'm going to talk a little bit about sustainability and just some things that from an agricultural perspective, I'd encourage the group to consider as it relates to genetically modified organisms. Um, first of all, in terms of sustainability, just give you guys a little bit of information. We want to make sure that the small local biodiesel producers here are not at an economic disadvantage relative to their larger competitors any more than small scale is. We've talked about 90% of the soybean oil or soybeans that are grown in the United States being genetically modified, so that's a factor to consider. In terms of economic return, uh, some outside studies have shown that the productivity of biotech has increased uh, by 6.8 billion pounds, the amount of crops that are available in the United States, and $44 billion worth of global value. In terms of economic return, $6.5 billion in 2004 and $27 billion in the first eight years that biotech were done. Now let's talk about the environmental aspects. And I, well, or I'm going to talk about the benefits right now, and then we can, yeah, I'm Beth Calaboda from Monsanto. Um, in terms of pesticide reduction, 379 million pounds less of pesticide used due to biotech. That's a 6% reduction. And in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, something that's really important to everyone here, if you're concerned about global warming, biotech crops have reduced 22 billion pounds the carbon dioxide emissions to the atmosphere. And let me put that in perspective. That's the same amount as taking 5 million cars off the road for one year. So there are two sides to every argument. I'm not saying that a debate isn't good, but as you define sustainability and think about keeping these small businesses in purpose, consider those facts. And I can give you uh, outside references if you want for these, because not, that's not my data. That's a compilation of four external sources. 
the size of the facility comes down if you're going to be more environmentally friendly. So I would suggest two things. One is that it's not so much the size of the facility, but it's what you're using to produce the fuel. You have to be produced using electricity, which means you're most likely now using coal in the United States. Well, in the West, it's a little more hydropower. And number two, I would suggest that there are grades. In other words, with buildings, you can have LEED certification that's gold, silver, uh, I think bronze is the next one down. And so one option is for a grading system to say this, is, this facility scores a 92 out of 100. And so it's, it's a gold. And this one scores an 83. And so there's a whole range of them that consumers can then choose from. Sustainability is, is, is not an end. It, it's a goal to, to move towards, and it's a stepwise product, um, process. And, and I think that there's often the risk of letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, and that, that there's always something that every business and every household can do to become more sustainable. I'm just kind of concerned. I think biodiesel is a great thing, but I feel like we're kind of only touching the leaves instead of the root of the problem, which is that we consume too much in the U.S. Mm -hmm. We consume 30% of the worldwide consumption. What are we doing about that? And when biodiesel gets huge and we're cutting down all the rainforest to plant soy and stuff like that, a Hummer that runs on biodiesel is not the solution to the problem. And as far as Monsanto goes, if you want... If you want some outside references about how it's affecting farmers, what about the farmers who have Monsanto crops blowing onto their land and polluting their crops and then Monsanto comes in and is suing them for that and driving them out of business and taking their life savings and they have no choice because they're not as powerful as Monsanto. So I think that this is a huge issue that we have to deal with, the roots of the problem, and not be bowled over by huge corporations and making money on, on biodiesel. From a consumer standpoint, I think that the way um, for smaller producers to earn consumer trust is, is really education um, and, and preparation for running biodiesel. Um, you know, if it, I wrote articles about biodiesel before running it, and I still made some classic blunders. And I think that, that for, for me, I mean, it's worth it to be able to say I did my best to my grandkids to, to leave this place like I found, you know, better than I found it or, you know, make a positive impact. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not saying that fueling your vehicle should be a transcendent experience or that everyone will do like what Oracle Fuels did for us and drive, you know, 20 miles at 3 in the morning to bring us biofuels because we couldn't find a biofuel station on the way down here. But that connection for me, is really important as a consumer, and I think that's what we're talking about when we talk about sustainability, is building you know, long-term vision and connection. And, and so I just wanted to offer that suggestion that maybe you know, the same way that the organic food industry has, has kind of tr trademarked that and said, you know, if, you care about, if you care about these issues and, and you want to build the community, um, you know, come to us. And I think, that, I think that there's a lot of room for smaller producers to, to make that the value that that larger producers can offer to consumers. Today, we heard about cold flow issues, you know, the problem is you blend it down here and you put it in the pipeline and you, by the time you ship it up to the uh, uh, northwest, uh, suddenly it's different. Okay, here's an idea, fuck the pipeline. All right. <laughs> Today we heard that you can't, make any bio, you can't make any money on biodiesel if you go with like the rack plus a dollar, Uncle Sam comes through with a tax credit, you're on virgin soy, it's like, screw it, you can't, uh, you can't make any money. Okay, here's an idea, fuck the price at the rack. We can't go on with business as usual. This is for the marbles. I don't care about a Monsanto study on GMO. Monsanto's balance sheets that tell us what can be sustained and not have to get shredded and flushed. We've got to transform our thinking. We've got to work on a different way of being. I can't wait to get started. Ask for nonviolent communication, Ronnie. <laughs> 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 Ronnie told me not to fuck you, but these get off the ground. Yeah, Ronnie told me to start the biofuels. Bathroom committee for showing up. Believe it or not, I personally believe in sustainability. I just define it differently, so thank you. <laughs> I define it differently too. That said, I'd like to see a show of hands 
Um, as to how many people think that genetically modified organisms should play a role in the sustainability of biodiesel, or can play a role? Can. Please, show of hands. Keep them up. I, got I don't really know the question. I don't understand. How many people believe that genetically modified soy or any kind of canola or anything is involved in sustainable biodiesel? Well, well let's have I, 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 no definition. This is, this is a discussion about talking about certification standards, and so this is a great debate that we can have, but I, I, we only have about 15 minutes left. Um, there's great work being done. This is our chance for, for real input. Um, let's table that debate, and let's really focus on um, our input for standards and um, the certification program. Let me, let me try and be clear to this. I'm sorry, I'm wondering if part of the standards is sustainability involved in turn on sources. Great question. Mm -hmm. Can I respond to that? I, I think that the definition for sustainability has not really uh, been, it hasn't been defined yet, first of all. Second of all, we're looking to everybody here to participate in that process. Um, and um, we would really re request and welcome anybody who wants to participate. Uh, there, oh my God! <laughs> we, we, I know, um, it freaks me out. Uh, we re really hope that everyone who wants to would participate and will participate. Um, and uh, and uh, I, I think that that is going to be the most complicated part of this process is really getting that definition. Um, down. So, so at this point, um, we just really like to encourage everybody to, to give as much input as you can, and, and you have, um, and including, um, you know, including everything. Pick up from the gentleman's comments earlier about sustainability issues not being black and white, and I think that there's a hell of a lot of big industry that would like us to believe that things are black and white, so that they can sell us solutions like clean coal natural gas and things like that which people think hey they're sustainable. In the UK there's been a move towards greater labelling to promote awareness um, of, of features of products so for instance it started with the health food movement where lots of people were selling foods as being healthy. Um, now supermarkets are introducing labelling systems which help people quantify fat, sugar, protein in a really easy accessible way. Developing this one stage forward, some of our major retailers, including Tesco, which is like our Walmart, B&Q, which is like our Home Depot, they're starting to look at carbon labelling for products and environmental labelling and looking at sustainability, not just in production, but over the whole life cycle of the product and producing that in a clear, accessible way that can be used across a wide range of products. And I think that it's important that when looking at labelling and standards, we look at what developments are already going on and how we can fit biodiesel within that framework um, because if not you just end up with fragmentation lots of different standards at the moment going back to the health foods we have a situation in the UK where two of our major supermarkets have two slightly different labelling systems both of which are clear on their own but, but neither of which are coherent to the consumer so if you look at health food labelling, we have stuff like, you know, clear, no GMO labels so that consumers can make a discerning choice. We're not saying that one's good or one's bad, but we're allowing people to make the choice for themselves. And, and similarly with carbon labelling, this will enable people to make, you know, choices about the amount of energy that's been invested in the manufacture of the product, how much it will use in its life cycle and how much it will use at a disposal. So maybe there's lessons to be learned here. Thank you. Green building guidelines for Habitat for Humanity. And I really looked at things where you're doing the point-based systems that are self-evaluation. I much prefer writing st standards that are written in best management practices because if our, really our goal is to provide the industry with the best management practice to produce a sustainable fuel, we need to give them ideas and techniques and methodologies to meet it. We also need to have standards that aren't strictly looking at just the product input. Okay, You can be making it out of the most organic, material you want, but if you don't have a sustainable business in business practices, you're not sustainable. If you're wasting energy, if you're wasting product, if you're dumping things in the ground, you're not managing your business in a green manner, you're not sustainable. So the standards should include the aspect of like a triangle. We got the product we're coming in, we got the process that we're going through needs to be sustainable, and the third triangle needs to be sustainable communities. We need to be paying living wages. We need to be treating our community as part of our sustainable practice for that localization. So the standards should be written on a triangular kind of thing as far as I'm concerned with best management practices. Let's bring them into the fold and get good product that meets our needs 
while taking care of the future generations. I can't agree uh, more with the, uh, like the food pyramid for sustainability. Uh, I think we should market the strengths of biodiesel and not trying to compete with diesel and diesel prices. When I was a dollar mm -hmm. more per gallon, my sales were still going up 30%. I had a hard time keeping up with it. And I think as long as we keep going in that direction, uh, I follow the organic food movement, the same people eat, orga eat organic food that want healthier fuel uh, and to go with that model instead of competing and to market your strengths, charge mm -hmm. more for it, to make it sustainable because it costs more. Good organic food. And sustainable business costs more. We're not stealing things from the earth. We're trying to borrow it. And the, the other side of that is if we're going to look at, you know, being totally different from the petroleum market, which has been our model from the beginning, you look at what your costs are, you look at a fair profit, and that's your price. And, you know, for the first eight years, we didn't raise our price. We're like, I think we're 70 cents cheaper because we're sticking to that model. And so we have to go on the other side, too, and we see some areas like on the West Coast where petroleum goes up, so then biodiesel goes up. So that's kind of defeating that process, too, is we don't want to react to the petroleum market all the time. We want to look at what's a fair profit and try to be flat. Localization makes that happen. Right. My name is Betty Batty, so I get a story about a dream come true. I did that about 85 times, at least a thousand school kids last year, so I'm here to speak for the youth. The ones that are in second grade, that are in the middle school, the ones that are in high school, and I've been working with them for about the last five years, so I want to continue that work. Um, also, in addition to that, putting biodiesel into school buses is the main focus of this group, you know, reaching out to manuf manufacturers that would actually look at getting close to their cost, if not a little bit above, um, to offer that, and there's a lot of reasons why. So I'd love to work with the team, the outreach team, sustainability, um, and continue working with kids. Four days ago, the front page of the World section of the New York Times was uh, biofuels dream turns into nightmare mm. and they had they talked about people wearing smog masks in Jakarta Indonesia and I think if we're going to do a standard it should probably exclude exported uh, feed or imported feedstocks because you know, my thinking is ultimately it can't be uh, sustainable if it's not local again referring back to the New York Times what was it a couple days ago where it says it's our fault I mean people global warming all that kind of good stuff and it's it's extremely hard sometimes to be positive to remain in the ray, as some folks say. And because you look around and you see all the stuff that's happening, and you know it's just like lunch. God, I get so pissed off. I had to leave the room. But it's inspiring to me to see people around here who give a shit, who want to get this done. And the one thing that I would that I would hope that you would reach out to is other people, other people of color, other people of less means than you who spent thousands of dollars to come to a conference like this for one day. Uh, we're fortunate, I'm fortunate that people support me, believe in me, and can send me over here. So let's not forget that you're the lucky few here and that there's a lot of people out there who think like we do who want to do like we do, but can't do like we do because they can't afford it. Our rating platform is lead, as well as getting away from the rack and setting a price that, that, that represents best business practices as well as feedstock representation, locality, getting away from imports. Um, and I'll leave it at that. I just really applaud the effort and want to be involved. There's a model out there called Valet. You guys probably, a lot of you have heard of it. It's the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies. And I just wanted to put in a plug for both. That set of principles is something that should be looked at uh, when it comes to giving credits for uh, this model. I worked on a project a year ago up at App State um, called the Collaborative Biodiesel Project. And what we set out to do was make a closed loop biodiesel system. So we really sat down and analyzed all of the energy and material inputs into the system. And then we analyzed all the waste streams coming out, you know, and we all know what those things are, all the heat that goes into it, the oil feed sucks that go into it, the, the alcohols, the catalysts, you know, the glycerol that's coming out, the wash water that's coming out, you know, and we sat down and we tried to figure out how can we do this in the most sustainable way, you know, can we use the sun to heat our 
processes? Can we make the glycerin into soap? Can we treat the water with plants and things? And so I, I would say as far as setting standards that you really begin to like look at it as a system like that is that we are making biodiesel and I commend you all for being here and realizing that we're making biodiesel and we're really glad we're making biodiesel but we're also all beginning to realize that a lot goes into it and a lot comes out of it and if we don't deal with those things in a sustainable way that it's all a bunch of bullshit really so um, I, I would say to really begin to identify those things when looking at standards and saying okay well we need heat how do we do that best we need this how do we do that best when you begin to set those standards and so could this be a forum for sharing of information? Because I think all of us are trying to figure out how to collect waste vegetable oil and make biodiesel on a small scale. And, uh, you know, there's Biodiesel Magazine is filled with these technologies that are not designed for this scale. And you see things about ultrasonic shock or waterless processing. And I sit there and go, holy sh Toledo, how can I analyze this in a way that brings it down to this scale. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, no, I know. I know. <laughs> but I mean, can this be also a, uh, well, I guess it's already been done. But can this be part of that as well? I mean, maybe this is your trade journal right there. I'm sorry to have uh, uh, <coughs> done that. We need information on how, what are the choices uh, to be sustainable? That's the long and the short of what my question is. Here, many of you guys were here, um, and we were doing a very similar format, and one thing that Daryl and I talked about um, a couple of months ago is how can we not do exactly the same thing as we did last year and come back and say, oh, shit, what did we, oh, we didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Because what happened between Sarah Hope and Emily and I, we said, okay, uh, who's doing the shadow conference this year? Emily, you, you're going to do it? You're going to do it in Philly? I'm not doing it in North Carolina again this year. And we said, okay, we are going to do it, and, and we're going to focus on this conference. And what was happening was an amazing parallel effort of Kelly and Bob and Daryl of, okay, the trade association that was mentioned at the last year's um, wrap-up is also getting formed. So I, what I really want is for us to not go home and forget everything that we have done this time after four years and actually do something. Like, I want a date. I want the next time that we're going to meet. Like, I, I want actual committees. I like, I want it to get done. <laughs> Don't compete on price. You'll never win. It's the only thing Big Oil has against little guys is they can compete on price. So you learn as you run a business that you can never run a business on price. Be it a co-op, be it an individual user, create customers that you can guarantee are going to be there for you. Passed the renewable fuel standard under 30 days. It was proposed and it was passed in 30 days. And I'm sitting on the committees now with Western States Petroleum, Exxon Mobil, Chevron. I mean, and, and guys way bigger than me, and they sit there and talk. What they try to do is bar you guys from existing. They create BQ9000 specs that are, that are pretty much, to me, don't really offer a lot to the table in the fact that I've got to pay a bunch of money to somebody else to come tell me I'm already doing it right. You've got, you know, homebrewers. I wouldn't exist without homebrewers who decide, who, who decide to like their wives more than biodiesel is a hobby and begin to buy bodies. You know, you guys are the movement behind here, and you need to actually get involved with your weights and measures. You need to get involved in these renewable fuel standard talks. You need to be, you know, if you start calling your legislators in your normal areas, they'll tell you if there's renewable fuel standard legislation. But you need to be involved or you won't be allowed to exist. These conversations will be superfluous. So be prepared to, to be active at that level, just, just to mention it. And that's also the way to make sure B99 still exists. Well, as we start to talk about sustainability, thinking more about side streams, I don't think that that's, we've brought that up enough. So what we're doing with glycerin, what we're doing with methanol, excess methanol, what we're doing with wash water, magnesol, whatever it may be, I think that, that we just need to bring up that conversation a little bit more and start thinking about that because it, especially for home brewers and small scale producers, I think it's more of an issue and it's really something that people need to. We offer at community college a very cheap <coughs> thing. It's $60. It's 12 weeks. It's an intro to biofuels course that gets people in the community, gets them there, teaches them what's going on. A, teaches them what they're using, why they're using it, and they take that home and they spread that. And it, it really, they do a lot of the legwork that 
you can't do yourself. And so letting other people do that work for you really does a great job. And everyone has a community college. And there are 50 qualified instructors in this room. And so you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to have the degrees and all this, just the need and the ability to do it. So I would just encourage, talk to your local community college. They'll let you in. They'll let you teach. Angie's also developing a two-year degree program for North Carolina State of North Carolina. I heard all the things we were talking about, and it occurred to me, well, one thing I've heard is that when they design a, re, a, a large-scale biodiesel plant, they source the beans from like 80 miles around or 100 miles. Because if you're much farther than that, rail costs just kill you dead. So that's darn near local. And so then I started to wonder, well, will the day come when the things we talk about here would go out into the, uh, the agricultural world and like, you know, a 60-mile radius, that's a group of people. And when you think about it, it already exists, and it's called the Farmer Co-op. And it's real strong in America. I mean, how many people here would know how to start a tractor? Okay. <laughs> All right. How many of the guys who really get the dirt under their hands have we, have we now, or can we maybe someday get into this dialogue? Because America has a Farmer Co-op model that might be one way that we implement what we care about. And the other one... Like my wife and I are in community supported agriculture programs where all summer, you know, from April to October, we're getting veggies that were grown within 50 miles of our place. Now, because we're carnivores, I go out in the fall and I kill what we eat for meat too, but that's another discussion. But the, the CSA concept, has, has anybody entertained the idea that maybe through the CSA infrastructure, and they exist and they're organized, there could be like a biofuels component CSA. CSB. Yeah, sure. You know, CSA <laughs> made, CSA distributed. That might be another model that we can implement and realize what we're kind of talking about here. Thank you. I think that you know we all basically agree on on 99% of the issues, and we all want communities to have vibrant income sources and sustainable fuel. But I, I think we all also want that for people all over the world. So I think. And then that coupled with the fact that these are global problems, climate change, energy security, um, community livelihoods. Um, so I think that, to, that what we should aim for is something more along the lines of creating standards that can be applied to fuels produced in other countries as well as here, as opposed to just saying, you know, we want our box. I wanted to remind people, in case they missed it, on the National Biodiesel Board uh, brochure, um, I think I was surprised that JoJo didn't mention it in, at the lunch talk, but... Um, they're, they're in the process of uh, kicking off their uh, biodiesel political action committee um, as kind of, I hope, I'm imagining it's a response to some of the abuses for tax credits and that sort of thing. And I, at the last, last year in San Diego, that was the legislative power that we need to continue. It's, I mean, it's all wrapped into one, you know, education and, and having uh, access of, to, to the product. It's all at once, but I think um, the, the legislation is just as key. So if, if we can also continue to um, infiltrate as much as possible into that pack, I think that would be good. So in just in case you didn't know about it, please consider getting involved with that too. One thing that I would like to offer, um, and um, maybe it's a date that um, Lauren <laughs> helped me out with, but because the uh, Business Alliance for Local Living Economies has a conference date set, and it's in San Francisco, California, and we, I know that we have an SBA uh, member who's based in San Francisco. If I can just propose that the next time that a sustainable biodiesel group meets so that there's another event that some of us get together to discuss localized biodiesel, that that be it, and that if anybody can come to that, and if they can't, uh, try and send your friends that might be on the West Coast or something like that. And if there is a, uh, an East Coast version of, of Valley, then that we kind of join forces with the lo local living economies on the East Coast and, and start that regionalization of sustainable biodiesel. And in, in addition to that, the website that we set up for this um, summit, I would like to put out like 
Matt's idea about really t discussing about side streams. Like, we have a really great side streams presentation that we can put up there and anybody can access and say, oh, this is what Piedmont is discussing about side streams. And so if people want to just throw information to me and I'll put it out there. And we can also set up a, a, a blog space or other things. If you have technical expertise or something to offer to help grow the website, Rachel's your contact person for that. What was that date? Is there one set? It's, um, I think it's May 31st. It's a trade organization that was created to benefit the businesses that make up the board of the NBB. And we're trying to set guidelines and criteria for where we all think, um, you know, the important things um, about the creation of, uh, that are involved in the creation and distribution of biodiesels. And, um, you know, what, I, I really like the idea of doing the, the leads, um, the lead uh, process where there are steps and there are different levels and everybody can be involved. This is one of the most difficult places right now to sell biodiesel. Um, they're, they're so cut down and everybody wants to buy biodiesel at 30 cents under the price of petroleum. So, you know, we're working, first of all, at the legislative level so they don't make it illegal to sell biodiesel. But anyway, just some of those things within the first year, that, that organization is a little bit over a year old. But the reason it's been so successful is because there's some money, there's some working people that are getting paid, you know, there are actually you know, paid attorney and, and all that. And so that's what we recognize about the, you know, trying to get these this um, other organization going is we have to get to a point where we can hire someone to do this work because it's everybody in this room is trying to make a living and is busy trying to run their own businesses. And so um, that's what <laughs> Step can. So that, that's what got us really interested when, you know, Hard Rock stepped up is because we saw a chance to build a real organization. And um, I just wanted to offer that because I know I think that that's some of the frustration of, you know, what do we, you know, from year to year going, what's, what's the next step and why can't we get it done? Seems like one place the crossover between this summit and, and SBA, which I think, congratulations for putting that together, um, might be a co another committee to offer a suggestion of a committee that would work towards integrating with NBB, what's been asked for earlier today, what Job is, um, is open for. If you want to be on that committee, come see me. Okay, that'd be great. And I, I think that's just a, a nice way to integrate the two um, without perhaps. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Sarah, Rachel, Emily, for organizing this.